Okay, our next group, I was calling it the Echinacea phyta before. It's more commonly called one of two other names. The Arthrophyta is what we're going to use for this. The name I believe your textbook uses. Or the other older name is the Sphena, Sphenophyta or Sphenophyta. But let's look at Arthrophyta first. Phyta, of course, is the division name for the plants. Arthros means jointed. So you know that name from other organisms, right? Arthropods, jointed feet. Arthropods, jointed feet. So it's a descriptive name for the arthropods. So here are arthrophyta jointed plants. And we'll talk, we'll see about what that means, why they're called jointed plants. The other name, the sphenophyta, Sphenophyta, again, phyta, the division name, sphena wedge. And this is a reference to the shape of the leaves. The leaves are very small, but they are wedge-shaped, as you'll see. <clears throat> because the leaves are so small, you really can't tell that they're wedge-shaped in most cases. So the sphenophyta, I don't know if that's why, but the sphenophyta name has tended to fall out of favor. Now, technically, there are recommendations. There's a botanical code of nomenclature, and there are recommendations in that code about how you should name divisions. And neither of these names follow those recommendations. The recommendations are it should be based on a genus within the, within the division. And that's why Equicetophyta is sometimes used, because the genus we're going to be studying here is Equicetum. Equus, do you know ec do you know the meaning of equus? You see the play equus? Horse. And sedum is bristle. So they are called the horse bristle or the horse tail is more commonly in English, the horse tails. These plants are homosporous. And since all homosporous extant plants are exosporic, they're also exosporic. Homosporous and exosporic. Here's an example of one. They're, they don't all look like this. They don't all have these branches. But these, that big frilly stuff on the side, those are branches. Let's try white. Ooh, that worked. branches. This is the stem. And if you looked here, these branches come out in at very distinct nodes. So in fact, let me do that first. Put this little lines here to show you the nodes. So distinct nodes and inner nodes. So you remember the nodes means knot or swelling. Inner node means Inter means between, so inner node between the nodes. Distinct nodes and inner nodes, and they're distinct because, or associated with that, is the fact that they have world leaves. World leaves and world branches. Because a branch always originates in the axle of a leaf. So if the leaves are world, the branches are world. There are exceptions to that, but they are very rare. Here's our life cycle. It's going to look just like the life cycle of Silotum, except that the morphology is different. So our big difference is morphology. Again, it's a, between the life cycle. It's a typical dibionic life cycle. It's got haploid, haploid stage, and a diploid stage. And there are multicellular organisms in both, the sporophyte in the diploid, and the gametophyte in the haploid. And there's one gametophyte with both antheridia and archegonia on it. And I've been telling you that there's weird sperm in all of these lower plants, weird looking sperm. In Equicetum is not an exception. Another spaceship-looking sperm here. 
there are specific characteristics now in the morphology that are going to distinguish this from all the other groups. And some of those characteristics have to do with the spores. There are some special structures on the spores. And also where the spores are born. There are special characteristics about where this, how this, the structures in which the spores are born, or even more correctly, where the sporangia are born, how the sporangia are born. So we'll come back to those things and see the difference. We're starting our study in this case kind of with the fertilization. So here's our zygote, and you can see our archegonium. Same basic structure of all the other archegonia. Neck cells, the sperm would swim down that neck to fertilize the egg at the bottom. Looks a little bit different, but the basic, same basic morphology we've been seeing. We have the young embryo that develops in that archegonium. Eventually there's a foot that's formed where nutrient transfer takes place. And then there's the axis of the plant, the root, shoot axis, which develops as the plant grows beyond the gametophyte. That results then in the rhizome of the plant, the underground stems of the plant, which are branched, and then the upright system. You see there was a bud here, and that bud grew out to form this, and there would be another bud here, grow out to form a new one. So this is a sympodial system. To produce our sporophytes. The sporophytes can have, and as is shown here, separate fertile axis and a separate vegetative axis. You notice that they look different. Those two axes look different from each other. And that's not just coincidental drawing. There are species where the axes look quite different like that. So they have dimorphic shoots. Two form, die, two, morphic form, two shoots with two forms. But there are other shoots that aren't like that. There are other ones that all the shoots look the same. And just some of them have a strobilis at the top and some of them don't. Here we're seeing our world leaves. Maybe I better switch to white again. Let's try that. If that works better. And you can't even see the distinct leaves right there, but I will show you another picture where we can see them. And that gives rise to world branches. White looks great, except when you try to write on white. And that's what we see then over here in this horsetail. This is one of a horsetail in the Pacific Northwest. I took that on a field trip with the Botanical Society many years ago. See the same thing, the world leaves here. Here we see over here the dimorphic shoots. These are dimorphic. These are the fertile shoots. And back here, those are the vegetative. So in this case, they look very different from each other. This is the strobilis, and we'll have to talk more about the structure of that in a minute. The structure of the strobilis is really what's going to set these plants apart. Well, I mean, these are the structure of the vegetative body is also very, very unique. This is not a very good picture, <coughs> but we we can see the rhizome and the above ground part of the plant with world leaves, the strobilis at the top, 
and I think we better go on to a better picture. Here we have the leaves. So here is a leaf. Look at the shape of that leaf. It's wedge-shaped, so it's what that gave it the sphenophyta. That's where the name comes from. And those leaves have got to be called, if there's any justice in the world, wedge-shaped leaves. Sphenophils. So wedge-shaped leaves. Now, those leaves are very interesting. Look at how small they are. However, they have multiple veins. And there is a gap in the vascular system. where they are attached. So what are they? Megaphils, microphils, or enations? They're megaphils. So there are big microphils and little megaphils. So it has nothing to do with the size. Now, in the past, these, again, are developed plants that were much richer in the Devonian. There was a much richer flora of the tree size, uh, ecosetums in the Devonian. And then they were, the leaves were bigger. You can really tell that they are. They were megaphils. They were big megaphils. They're still megaphils, but they are small megaphils. Dr. Schmidt, I just have a question. Um, since those leaves look like that, they also have like, stomata as well. Do they have what? Stomata. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Do these leaves have stomata in it? And I, I, I don't know for sure, but most of the photosynthesis in these plants takes place in the stems and the branches. So I wouldn't expect, if they were stomates, and there may be, I wouldn't expect them to be very functional in the leaves. I would expect the functional stomata to be found in the stems. The stems are green. The leaves are often a brownish color, so they don't even look like they have, um, like they're, like they have functional chlorophyll in them. So I wouldn't expect functional stomata. Same things again, this is the ground level. We see again the dimorphic shoots in this species. The rhizomes underground. And of course the strobilus above ground. In that strobilus, we have spore-bearing structures. And these are not leaves. They are not modified leaves. So they are not sporophylls. Let's look at the structure and then we can talk about why they're not leaves. A little bit anyway. So here is the structure of the what we're going to call the sporangiophore. And I am sometimes really lucky on these days because a student has left an umbrella in the class. And I am not lucky this year. Does anyone have an umbrella? Great, right, look at this. We have an umbrella. This brand now I just have to know how to open it. The sporangiophore has an umbrella shape. So So there is the structure of the sporangiophore. So we, we held it up here, we would have, we have a problem here, don't we? There's the stem, and there's the cap of it, and then hanging down from that cap, we find the sporangia underneath it. So the sporangia are on, hmm, which side of the sporangiophore is this? Would this be the side toward the axis or away from the axis? 
for the axis. And what side is that called? It's on the adaxial side. Adaxial side. Actually, adaxial side is often where we find the um, sporangia on leaves, even too. But you see that there are different structures here. There's a different structure. So on the adaxial side, we find these sporangia. And this shape, this umbrella shape, is called peltate. So these are peltate sporangiforms, sporangiophores. And if we look at them in, uh, in the anatomy, we would find that they have a vascular system that is similar to the, to the stem. So there's a vascular system in these sporangiophores that is similar to stem. Now, they also don't look leaf-like. You'll see them in lab, and I'll have a better picture in just a second, but they are, have a different vascular system. So they are modified stems. And this is the first group we see then where we have sporangia born on modified stems. Second strange thing about this is about the spores. If we look in the spores in detail, we find that as the spores dry, there are little arms that come off these spores. These are called elators, and elator means driver. We'll explain in a minute why that word is appropriate. Laters are this little arms that are on the, around the spores. So here we have the same things. We've got here are the, is, there's the strobilus, there's the sporangiophore. You can see more clearly here that it's, whoa, what happened to my pen? that it's peltate, it's an umbrella shape, with the sporangia hanging down on the adaxial side of that. Same thing over here, just drawn from a different side. Sporangia hanging down, multiple sporangia like that. We usually don't see that on sporophylls. Another view of that, here it is from the top. So there's the top of the umbrella. Here are our sporangia. Here it is, up, flipped upside down. Sporangia again. So lots of different views of this structure. Here they are in a picture of the thing in situ. So there's a sporangia for. before it's opened, before the sporangia have opened. Here it is cut open. And I hope you can see on this side, there's the center axis and the little cap there of each of these. So there are little peltate sporangiophores. with our sporangia hanging down toward that main axis. And here they are open, with the sporangia open. So there's the sporangia for. And there's the sporangium. And it's open here. You can see it's kind of weird shape there. Even more clear here. Even more clear down there. have opened up, shedding the spores. Here's that process as it would take place. Here's our sporocytes. And that didn't work at all. Let's try another color.
Here is the peltate sporangiophore. Here is a sporangium. And inside those sporangia, we have the sporocytes. This, uh, this was taken in class. We're just going to do the same thing again, except in another picture. So this one was from lab. There it is again, the sporangiophore, the sporangium. There's our spores. And you can see around those spores, maybe there's that one's come off there, but there's other places. These are the elaters that are going to function in spore dispersal, release of the spores from the sporangium. So you may be photographing something like that next week. Here's the elater, the driver. So we can talk now about how these function. Here's the elater wrapped around the spore. So when the spores are formed, they are in this environment where there's a lot of moisture. They're in the internal sporangium. And like all internal parts of these organisms, they're in a moist environment. It's not, it's not like open water, but it's a moist environment. <clears throat> There's no evaporation because it's being controlled by the covering of the tissues, the cuticle on the outside of the plant, and the stomates. In those conditions, this elater is wrapped around the spore. You don't even see it separated that much from the spore. But the elater, the material of the elater, it's not cellular material, and it's hygroscopic. Have we done hygroscopic yet? Hygro water scope is to look out for. So hygroscopic is looking out for water. So it's going to absorb water when it when it opens up. I'm sorry, it's going to it's absorb water when it's open. Start that sentence over again. It's absorbed water in this moist environment and it's wrapped around the spore. As it dries, it goes and becomes these arms. It comes away from, breaks away from the spore wall, or the spore wall breaks away from the spore, so to speak. Now, as it does that, as it does that, here's what happens. Now, I need volunteers from the audience. Two volunteers. Somebody who really doesn't. Yes. Someone who really doesn't want to do it. That's what I like. Oh no, it's great. It's not bad. What do you mean it's not that bad? It's like great. So not, it's so not that bad. Okay, so I need one of you inside of me. Now you can, these, you are now aquacetum spores. And here are your elaters. Notice the resemblance between those elaters and those little paddles on the end. I mean, let's, let's practice with our elaters. There we are. Now the elaters are wrapped up around the spore. And, and the spores are packed together here. Now what happens when the elaters start to dry up? Right? So here we are, the elaters, oh, and now, Right. You got you. <laughs> so as we, as they dry out, they push their way out of the sporangium. So the sporangium is cracking open at the same time, and the elaters are essentially walking their way out of the spores. So <clears throat> as they walk their, as they um, rehydrate, as, as the water, as the um, environment gets a little moister and dry out again, they continue to do that. The spore <clears throat> elaters wrap around and dry out, and wrap around and dry out, and they push not only against themselves, they push against their environment, and they can do a little walk away from that. And if we like to, we can think of that as the dance of the elaters. And why not? <clears throat> so here they are in a semi-expanded state, and here they are in the sporangium with lots of elaters there. And you can see how that would exactly happen, right? Our, our, little, our little demonstration was perfect there. Those elaters are pushing against each other. I'm going to start to work their way out of the sporangium. 
Here they are in SEM. This is a really nice picture of an SEM. And here it is. This, this one down here was taken in our lab. That's a really nice picture, too. Here you see them in the light microscope with the elaters pushing against each other, and you can almost imagine them walking away from each other. We have rarely had these things in lab, but you can, if we have spores like this, you can actually see the elaters drying out and kind of walking across your slides. The spores germinate. And here we have the young gametophyte. Remember, this is homosporous and exosporic. And here's the mature gametophyte in two views. I think this one was taken in the lab. This one was not. This is growing on auger. But you can see the resemblance between the gametophytes there and here. These are the antheridia. You should be able to start to recognize them. Well, it's not so clear so it's so dark. It'd be better on your own computers. But there's that sterile jacket of cells and a big mass of dense tissue in there, which is kind of granular, which would be the cells that are going to produce the, spor the sperm. If we look down here, right, we see something that looks quite different. These are the archegonia. And again, you can see, at least in this one, you can see the neck cells and that open canal where the sperm will swim down. So all of these plants are dependent on water for the fertilization. They have to be, the gametophytes have to be growing in a moist environment, and then the sperm can swim, we hope, from one gametophyte to another to accomplish cross-fertilization. Here again, the same kind of thing we were seeing last time. I think there are only, what is that? Is that an antheridium or an archegonia? That's an antheridium. That's a better photograph now for you to see the structure I've been talking about. I don't see an archegonium right off. There may be one there someplace I'm not finding. It's hard to see what's over here, but I think it's antheridia. So this is all the gametophyte. And here they are growing on auger again. And here's the young sporophyte. And this was the gametophyte in this area. And that brings us back to our life cycle, which is really no different than any other dibionic life cycle we've seen, except for the morphology. So I'm not even going to walk through this one all the time because I want to go on and restart the ferns. <clears throat> but it's no that significant difference from anything else except for these morphological differentiations we've seen. And the, the sporophyte you see is really very distinctive in this case. Its appearance is very distinctive. It's got those whorled leaves. It's got megaphils, which is unusual in these lower plants. And it's got these unusual sporangia. Uh, the way that the sporangia are born is unusual in the sporangia fours and then the elaters. So lots of characteristics that distinguish this group. There are quite a number of species of equisetum.